Hello, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Newtopia and our panelists, welcome to the webinar today. It is our hope that each of you, as well as your loved ones, are remaining safe and healthy. My name is Mark Jackson. I'm the head of commercial uh, at Newtopia, and I'll be your moderator for this session. The case for habit change to prevent disease and lower cost. Today, I'm joined by healthcare industry experts. Hassan Azir. A visionary and innovative human resources total rewards executive with a demonstrated track record of achievement in the design and management of compensation and benefits programs, total rewards, employee engagement, financial management, as well as HR operations. Hassan has nearly 30 years of experience and has held executive level roles at Delphi Automotive Systems, U.S. Foods, and Mondes International. He's also a Total Rewards Advisor and Board Member for Employer Health Innovation Roundtable. We also have with us today, Dr. Greg Steinberg. He's an experienced physician executive who is a cardiologist by training with over 20 years of experience in varied healthcare settings, academic medical center, population health management, as well as large US healthcare payers. Greg's experience includes Associate Director of Medicine and Director of Medical Education at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center, Chief Medical Officer and Chief Executive Officer at Active Health Management, a startup population health management and clinical decision support company. And most recently, he served as the first head of clinical innovation at Aetna. Our next panelist is Jeff Ruby. He's a health innovator, founder and CEO of Newtopia. He's a global thought leader on hyper-personalized and engaging strategies to deliver proven, scalable, and sustainable habit change and disease prevention. Jeff is a serial entrepreneur who has founded three other companies, all with a focus on novel concepts to true healthcare. Today, we'll be discussing the importance of investing in health improvement initiatives for at-risk employees. This webinar will explore the intersection of COVID-19 and employee health from a clinical, strategic, and benefit design perspective. The panel will provide insight into the latest research, uh, conditions of patients with COVID-19 who experience hospitalization and death, how decreasing obesity can improve cost in a year, how benefits leaders can use data to make decisions for benefit design, and what science says about how to inspire sustainable habit change. A few housekeeping needs. All attendees are on mute. Questions are encouraged and will be answered at the end of the presentation. And questions can be posed via the question icon or the chat feature. Uh, let's get started. Our first presenter will be Hassan. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, excited to be here. and sharing some in insights into Newtopia's program and how preventing chronic disease is gonna help employers uh, in the near and long term. So I'll, I'll just start with a little bit of background and, and talking about some of the challenges that employers are facing. Um, for those of you that are listening that are a benefits leader and or on the employer side, uh, pardon me, I'm, speak I'm preaching to the choir. But as benefits leaders, we're continually called on to address unexpected challenges, whether it's a, a budget, change or a forecasting problem or new regulations or vendor changes or technology hurdles. Uh, we're always trying to find that perfect plan design. But having been a benefit for a long time, I realized that nothing has prepared benefit leaders for what's going on today. It's a perpetual nonstop stress on our company, our teams, our policies, our vendor partners, and mostly on all of us too, as we try to figure out how do we deal with um, the un ongoing change and expectations. So we will all be moving through the days and the months ahead, expecting more change and more uncertainty. And we're all gonna be editing those goals and those three-year plans that we've, ma we've made. But as the uncertainty and the scrutiny of our benefit plans increases, it's important that your company should not be changing its goal of having healthy employees. And as you're about to hear, this is even more and more important and relevant now with COVID-19. And as businesses are reopening, employee health will be a consideration for those employees actually entering the building. But it's more than that. We can't ignore how chronic conditions are impacting the severity of COVID-19 cases. 
There is increasing evidence that heart disease, asthma, diabetes, and other chronic conditions are leading to increased complications and increased stays in the hospital. So while you've been managing the incidence and prevalence of chronic disease in your population over the past few years, that effort takes on a new urgency as we learn how these conditions are exasperated with COVID. So now as we look at our benefit strategies and we start to pivot into new priorities, it's important that we do that carefully, slowly and objectively, and we try to try to still make sure that we're meeting our goals. Next slide. So planning ahead, as you all know, this is the time of year that benefit leaders are taking stock of the programs that they have. They're looking at the ecosystem they've built over the past few years. They're looking at last year's data, engagement reports, costs, fees, contracts, return on investment if you're lucky, et cetera. But more than that, as we look at the programs we have in place, we have to think about the plans that we're gonna place now, next year, and the year after. We have to think about those plans that we had made, the things that we said we were going to do next year. Uh, we have to think about what do we want all those programs to do? Uh, are, are the goals that we set and the priorities, are they still valid for the company and your employees? And we have to think about programs and vendors that we have in place for some time and evaluate the impact they've had. Are the employees and dependents using your existing programs? Are these services and tools improving health? Are they reducing costs? Are they increasing satisfaction or engagement? And more importantly than that is what you need to do now, what you need to add, what will make an impact and what's gonna improve health. So time to look for programs that are actually proven to have an impact. We can't just rely on marketing material and promises from salespeople. Our employees deserve to have access to programs that are scientifically proven to work. We have to be looking for services that are really improving health, things that are valued by employees, things that are gonna improve your benefit expenses, and things that are gonna reduce the risk factors for your population. It's a good time to see if your program has any guarantees, and if not, partner with someone that does. And as you evaluate, evaluate your ecosystem, consider which vendors and partners are actually working with other programs and vendors, meaning they complement your other health improvement programs, not cannibalize them. And you want, to find, you want to find things that are continually used by employees. In the end, we all want programs that are continue to, continuing to drive value, improving health and having high usage and be relevant to you, the company and to your enrollees. Next slide. And of course it matters that the programs are actually used by employees, not just the early wave of, of enrollees that register for your newest program. There's always a good segment of your population that's gonna sign up for every new thing that comes along. You need to see employees that are gonna to wanna to use the program continually day in, day out, year after year, new people enrolling, excitement has not waned. <clears throat> You've probably seen too many programs where interest and impact dips down after the initial rush, or your employees are moving on to the next new thing you introduce. So the most effective program is the one that can weather any obstacle. Today's environment is challenging our programs and vendors as the interest concerns and ability to focus on health is gonna be inconsistent and spread apart for your employees. People everywhere are focusing on whether or not they have a job, what's going on with their family, can they pay their bills, how they're gonna handle the stress of social distancing. So the question is, how do we get people enrolled in the right program now at the right time? So Jeff's gonna talk about how Newtopia has been managing to do just that. Uh, thanks, Hassan. And um, yeah, I think now more than ever, uh, just actually, thank you, now more than ever, I think uh, the, the key is really to focus on those key strategies for success. And, and it's been interesting that the, the past uh, few months of, of COVID-19 has certainly had a, a shaking impact on each and every one of us and, and especially in Utopia. But we've, uh, we've managed to see some uh, increasingly high rates of engagement through these months. And I'd say it really comes down to um, three key factors on, on why we continue to see uh, those high rates of engagement. Um, you know, the first is uh, around building a, a truly hyper-personalized experience. And the word personalization gets a lot of airplay, sometimes a little bit too much, and, and it's almost become one of those words that people don't know. But when I talk about uh, hyper-personalized experience, it's, it's really about um, having taken the time to get to know each and every participant in advance. 
Uh, and so it's taking that time to learn about individually as we do so through a combination of behavioral, genetic, uh, and social determinant data. But whatever form that takes, it's about really understanding people and then meeting them where they are uh, and then designing experiences that are going to be meaningful to them. And so rather than trying to bring someone to the curriculum, it's actually trying to design the entire experience around each individual. The second point in strategy is, is that the whole purpose of this should be around uh, ultimately building confidence and we believe uh, in changing new habits. Uh, and that requires, again, that one size fits one orientation, um, whereby as opposed to instructing, as opposed to teaching, um, which may have a limited benefit, uh, rather it's how do you ultimately change the confidence interval of each individual by knowing them so well? And how do you use a proven habit change formula to incrementally improve um, each and every step so that ultimately not only is the individual engaged, but they're able to benefit because the snowball effect starts taking place that they're actually able to accelerate their own gains in the future. And then finally around incentive design, it's, it's really making sure that the incentives are aligned uh, ultimately, incentives are great. There's been a lot of um, uses uh, and good uses of extrinsic motivation. But if it doesn't tie ultimately to getting to intrinsic motivation and making sure that um, we're tapping into what is that intrinsic motivation of that individual and how do we perpetuate it going forward, then unfortunately, I don't believe uh, any amount of financial motivation alone is going to do it uh, to be able to manage the kind of engagement through uh, good times and stormy times like we're seeing now that Hassan just mentioned uh, in the future. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so, um, Greg, why don't you speak to us a little bit about uh, some of the, the latest research around pre-existing conditions and uh, obesity as it relates to, to COVID and hospitalizations and death? Sure. Uh, thanks very much. Um, so, uh, the main point of this slide is uh, is to show a couple of things. So the first is that, unfortunately, uh, this COVID-19 is now uh, on track to become one of the top five causes of death uh, in the United States, joining things like cancer and heart disease and lung disease. And uh, as a result, it's impossible to ignore it. Um, what is and has been known now for some time is that a significant uh, proportion of the people that get really sick from COVID-19, meaning you know they get admitted to the intensive care unit and or die, have underlying comorbidities, uh, things like hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease, lung disease. And that's been fairly well understood now for some time. Next slide, please. However, what is being increasingly recognized and was not recognized initially um, is that obesity appears to be an independent risk factor in and of itself. And the reason it, it probably wasn't recognized initially, by the way, was, was probably two things. First of all, the initial data, as you know, came out of China and uh, there actually are less obese people in China than there are in other parts of the world, particularly like the United States. That's number one. Number two, and probably uh, most saliently, is that most of the uh, demographic data that uh, are, are obtained when studies are reported actually do not mention weight or waist circumference. So it was it was only when people kind of started to notice almost anecdotally that the people in the intent that that were in their intensive care units happened to be a lot a huge proportion of them happened to be obese that they started looking at it and then reporting on it and yes lo and behold now there's a big body of literature that talks to it um, and it appears that it probably has its effects through several kind of related types of mechanisms. The first, which is on this slide on the left, is that obesity has certain physiologic uh, uh, and mechanical uh, uh, downstream effects, if you will, that make, make it, for example, difficult to breathe if you have a big chest wall. Uh, so that's one type of problem. Uh, the second problem is that obesity tends to move um, biologically with a lot of those comorbidities that we talked about in the prior slide, like hypertension and diabetes and heart disease that we've already 
agreed are bad for people who develop COVID-19. And then last, which is related but a little different, is that uh, obesity is uh, uh, one of the major risk factors of something called metabolic syndrome, uh, which has its own inherent metabolic risk, which I'm gonna get into uh, in the next slide. So next slide, please. Right. So metabolic syndrome is technically defined as having at least three out of these five elements on the left side of the slide being out of the normal range. So if you have at least three out of five, you technically have metabolic syndrome. And it's a highly prevalent issue. It, you're talking about one in four adults in most Western societies have metabolic syndrome. And when and if you have it, it's a bad thing. You have serious other issues that are gonna almost certainly happen. You have a significant increased risk of developing full-blown diabetes, double the risk of developing significant heart disease and triple the risk of, uh, of having a stroke. If you have only one or two of these five factors out of, out of range, technically you don't have metabolic syndrome, but you're clearly at risk for developing it. And that represents one or two factors out of range represents another one out of three individuals in the United States. And we looked at this in previous work that I did when I was at Aetna. Um, and it turns out that of the five, of those five metabolic syndrome risk factors, the one that is the most important in terms of determining subsequent risk of developing metabolic syndrome and developing bad clinical outcomes and increased costs is actually obesity. And that knowledge is what prompted us when I was at Aetna to turn to Jeff and Utopia to see if we could design a study that looked at this issue particularly to see if we if we could identify people who were at risk of having a metabolic syndrome and then focused on doing something about their obesity, would that intervention, if it were successful, would that have a proven beneficial effect on outcomes and costs? Next slide, please. So we designed a, a trial when I was uh, the, the head of clinical innovation at Aetna that was uh, published in uh, the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine in 2015 that actually looked at that. So what we did is we did this with Aetna employees. We randomized about uh, just over 2,800 people. 945 of those were set aside as a control. And that makes this a randomized control trial, which as uh, many of you probably know, is considered the gold standard of types of trial designs. We invited, therefore, the 1890 that were not the control group. We had to limit registration to 600 individuals because we were, my, my team was allocated a budget and that was basically all we could afford. So uh, 600 people were officially registered and then we cut off the registration. Of those 600, 445 went on to actually enroll in the program. And of those 445, 264 self-reported as program participants and 221 met the uh, uh, trial pre-trial pre design criteria of engagement. So that's the so-called waterfall of how we designed the trial. So what happened? Next slide, please. So this is what we found. Um, of the uh, of enrollees, 50% at the end of a year remained engaged, which is an extremely high percentage and Jeff will probably talk to that more later. So that's number one. Number two, on average, there was a 10 pound loss of weight, which represents about 4.3% of the 
of the pre-programmed weight of the individuals in the trial. That was a highly statistically significant number at the P less than 0 0.001. And I realize not many of you may be happy with these numbers, but that means that that result, there was a less than one in a thousand chance that that result happened by chance. So that's on the clinical side. On the cost side, when you compared the cost of the program participants with those in the control group, remember the people that just were set to the side, didn't get any, any intervention, there was a 1,464 per member per year savings in those program participants in 12 months, right? So, and that is also a highly statistically significant number at the P.02 level, meaning there's about a two in a hundred chance that that is a random result. So that's, uh, that's the, the result of the trial. And I think I'll hand over to the next speaker now. Next slide, Rachel. So we're, we're going to move to Jeff to speak a little bit about uh, sustainable habit change uh, and a little bit more about the, the results from that randomized control trial. Jeff? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Mark. And, and you know, one of the things that we're most proud of um, is, is actually, you know, the fact that we had this opportunity to work with that on a multi-year randomized control trial while we were very fortunate to publish our 12-month outcomes in the peer review journal. Um, we actually were able to track um, the study through 24 months, and uh, the results that uh, Greg just reviewed in year one um, you know, were, uh, again, terrific, as, as good as anything published uh, in and around uh, you know, chronic disease prevention, and that you know, ended up yielding a, a two times in-year ROI, so it paid for itself and then some in the first year just in, the, in those uh, $1,464 in paid medical cost savings. It's actually what happened, not at the end of the first 12 months that we're most proud of, it's actually what happened at the end of 24 months because it's a sustainable habit change platform, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. What we're interested in is actually seeing if we can see outcomes that grow over time. And uh, what we saw was that 90% you know, of those participants that continued into year two uh, continued that risk reduction such that the average body weight moved from 10 pounds or 4.3% that Greg just reviewed up to just over 22 pounds or 10% body weight reduction. And what that's signifying is that a few things are happening. The participants on average uh, are seeing growing outcomes uh, over time, which is really important because you don't want to have a short-term impact that then boomerangs right back. Uh, that's a typical diet approach, uh, but rather you want to see these outcomes that grow. And what it means for uh, Aetna or any other risk-bearing employer is that the the two times ROI delivered at the end of 12 months turned into more like three and a half to four times at the end of 24 months. And so everything is improving and we've been able to now replicate those results or in fact improve them in our broader commercial book of business. But these are also significant against the gray line here, which represents the best of today's uh, sort of traditional CDC based diabetes prevention program. And that line uh, is really based on a one size fits all approach. Um, and it, it actually, those results, whether delivered in person or online, get there a little faster than what we saw. But then that's the really the highest point at 16 weeks. And then from there, there you see in the literature the sort of degradation of these results through year one and into year two. So the likelihood of risk reduction coming back or cost coming back is, is uh, a lot higher. And so um, we've been able to really differentiate on those growing results over time, uh, which is exactly what sustainable habit change is all about. So over the next slide. When I talk about um, this formula for success uh, and this habit change, I think it's really important just to differentiate um, how Newtopia is different and where this habit change formulation comes from. And I think the best way is on the left-hand side, the traditional approach to prevention uh, has been most profound in type 2 diabetes, in something the CDC has created uh, in the traditional diabetes prevention program. And it's largely based on the way most of us have gone to school. And so just imagine uh, that time, however long ago that was for each of you, but uh, there was a course created by a professor, in this case by a government body and agency, um, and um, students are attracted to it, either through uh, an in-room class, less so today, more so online, uh, where there may be some group dynamics in place, 
but at the end, uh, it's taught by an instructor, the same to everybody. And at the end of the 16 weeks or four months thereabouts, which is a typical college course, um, the hope is that um, you've yielded enough knowledge and smarts uh, that uh, will, will then you know, make improvements in your active behavior. And I would just ask for you to think about what course have you ever taken that not only made you smarter, but then actually changed the course of every single one of your activities. Because that's really the way that we're hoping 100 million Americans today are gonna to prevent type two diabetes. Newtopia thinks a different school is required, one that actually puts the student in the center uh, and takes the time to get to know them uh, through a combination of social, behavioral, and genetic data, uh, but then takes that to design meaningful experiences so that not only is the right content developed for each individual, but the way of delivering it, who should deliver it, how to gamify it and how to make it social, except this school isn't really about building knowledge and smarts. It's actually about fundamentally building confidence and using a proven habit change formula to see if, if that student can not improve his or herself over time. That's really where Newtopia differentiates. Um, and we've actually sought and now received full accreditation from the CDC as an alternate diabetes program uh, the first of its kinds for a precision health approach. And so now we have the full accreditation of the CDC, but in a one size fits one version, as opposed to the one size fits all where things began. Over to the next slide. Just to show you what that looks and feels like, let's just take an example of um, a typical self-insured employer. I've made them up. I'm gonna use Acme Corp as an example. Uh, and so today as a self-insured employer, uh, they should know that roughly 50% of their employees have these two or more out of range risk factors that we've been discussing. Why? Because as part of their benefits, they'll be using tools like biometric testing or health risk assessments or claims data analysis, or maybe a risk screener. And what we're doing is we're pulling those data sources that already exist uh, to identify Steve. Steve represents the bald gentleman in the middle. Again, he's fictional. We've made him up. He represents one of the 50% of at-risk individuals at Acme. And as Steve learns that he's got a greater chance of having a heart attack or a stroke or potentially developing type 2 diabetes, those risk factors that we discussed is, is so dangerous, um, we then want to invite Steve. And that's really our first step. Oftentimes, it's a co-branded email between Acme and Utopia going something like, hey, Steve, we understand you're at risk. Here's a program that's going to be paid for by Acme and powered by Utopia to address those risks and help you achieve your best health, we're seeing anywhere between 25% up to 50% of the Steves take us up on it. Now that Steve's a Newtopia participant, our job is really twofold. We want to learn about him, so we design experiences meaningful to change habits. The learning takes place in a couple ways. Uh, we want to learn about him socially. Who is he? Where is he from? What's his parents like? So we can get the social determinants of his health. We also want to learn about him behaviorally. What's his personality, motivation, readiness to change? We then go a next step and we want to help Steve understand himself genetically. And here we're really pioneering in an area I'd call genetic engagement. I'm going to explain it more in a moment, but we're using genetics not to identify risk. We already know Steve's at risk. Rather, we see a benefit to using genetics for the potential to engage and act as a spark for motivation. Now that we've learned about Steve socially, behaviorally, genetically, we go on to design experiences meaningful to change habits, which include a number of tools. The first is the best of human, where we match Steve up to a person that we employ. They're called inspirators. They're coaches at Newtopia. Um, and we use behavior science, much like a match.com or an eHarmony, to find the best fit. Because ultimately, the inspirator is going to be that catalyst for meeting Steve where he is and driving that incremental habit change. We then want to make sure we've got the right plan queued up for Steve across the right nutrition, exercise, mental and behavioral health. So full lifestyle except we're not just going to throw the guideline book at Steve. We want to meet him where he is, take that genetic data to then shape what should those recommendations be based on his readiness and where he's starting from. We extend all of that through great technology. It's mobile first. So Steve is going to have his own uh, custom app built that hosts the relationship with the inspirator, that has the plan available and an easy way to track against it, but also connects the right wearable and wireless sensors. Uh, so that we're going to provide Steve a smart cellular scale. We're going to ensure that he has an activity tracker we can deploy or one that he can plug in. We want to make sure uh, that he's got the right gaming environment for him. Uh, and so the right motivation is taking place. Uh, and so 
whether he's a competitive person or a social person, he'll participate in those type of activities that meet his sense of fun. And then finally, we want to introduce him to a community of others, very similar to, to himself, uh, to act as a support tribe, if you will, um, who are going to provide uh, the right encouragement, the right empathy, uh, and the right support alongside the information he's getting from his coach. Uh, and so now he's got really everything he needs to incrementally build confidence and change those habits. The one thing that is critical about this differentiation is that it comes down to one statement. We don't have the audacity to believe we have the answer for Steve before we've met him. And rather, what we do is become a student of Steve. We see that our job should be about learning all about him and then designing this experience, which has a number of components, completely uniquely, so that no two Newtopians will go through it the same way. But the idea is not just to do this to the contrary. We're doing this because this is built on a proven habit change formula where we expect at the end of 12 months, as we've shown in our RCT results, and consistently, consistently demonstrate that we can have a positive improvement across the five main metabolic risk factors. But that's really where our starting point is. We expect those outcomes to grow, that improvement to grow over time. And we're looking for that doubling effect to take place at the end of 24 months. Over to the next slide. Just on the genetic engagement, a little bit more information here. Here, we've really been pioneering in this for the last decade. Um, and it deserves a little explanation. What we're trying to do for Steve is answer two fundamental questions. The first, has he inherited any factors from mom and dad that may be having an impact on his weight and lifestyle, namely so Steve can stop blaming himself? Because at the root of that blame lies a big confidence interval that where if Steve can stop blaming himself and maybe open up to the possibility it's not his fault, we can then move from there to help build and instill new confidence and build new habits. And so it's really critical. It leads to the second question we're trying to answer, which is how do we arm Steve with a greater sense of control over what to do about it? Effectively, can we take the data from the limited genetic test, we're only looking at three genes, very narrow on purpose, uh, to help shape the recommendations we provide across nutrition, across exercise, across mental and behavioral health. So there's, there's this aha moment, there's this, oh, you mean this may not be my fault, and oh, now I know exactly what I need and could do to focus on to do something about it. And it's really that focus on engagement and spark that's so very important. And that's what genetic engagement's all about. Over to the next slide. And so one of the things that we also come in with, and this really ties back to what Hassan was talking about, is that based on the work we did with Greg and Etna to prove out these results in a randomized control trial, we wanted to commercialize with a very powerful value-based model, where at the end of the day, we're putting skin in the game to ensure that we go at risk for engagement and we go at risk for outcomes, and most importantly, align our interests to both our employer, clients, and partners, and to Steve's best interests. And so here's how we do it. First, uh, we charge in three different buckets. As Steve or Stephanie or whoever that individual as the case may be, I'm just using him as an example, puts up his hand to say, I wanna join Newtopia. The first thing we do is we send him a welcome kit. It's a box that goes out with all the tools he needs to be engaged and sticky. Uh, we bill Acme for that. It's pure pass through. Uh, so we're really just passing through our cost to Acme for Steve to have all the tools he needs to be engaged and sticky. Number two, every month that Steve is engaged in the Newtopia experience. And there's a high bar for engagement. To be engaged, Steve has to complete at least one inspirator session or actively track 15 of 30 days. So really doing something. Uh, and in that case, we charge a monthly subscription fee uh, and that in entitles Steve to unlimited access to his inspirator, unlimited access to the technology platform. What it means for Acme is that they're only paying for individuals who are using the platform. And what it means for us at Newtopia is that we've got to be really great at engaging Steve or we don't bill uh, and make no money. So there's risk for engagement there. But even there, we're effectively just passing along our costs uh, for our inspirator time and our technology. Number three, if at 12 months, Steve has achieved that 5% or greater body weight reduction, which you'll recall from Greg's presentation, ties back to our randomized control trial. At that point, we know that we will have had that positive improvement across the key metabolic risks, we will have driven that roughly $1,464 in paid medical cost savings, then we charge an outcome milestone. It's effectively an opportunity for us to participate in a little bit of the gain share that we know we've created. And that's where our core margins are. And so I can honestly say that we're totally aligned to an employer and to Steve in that 
we're only, we've got to be really good at identifying Steve at that point of wanting to make a change. We've got to engage Steve each and every month, but that engagement must lead to um, outcomes that have been clinically proven to both reduce Steve's risk and also drive cost savings and prove an ROI that grows over time or else nobody wins. And I can't think of a better alignment model than that. Very different from the traditional per member per month or a capitated model where those incentives just don't exist. Last, next slide, please. And finally, why is this all important? And I just wanna tie this back to really where we started from in this case for habit change and why this is important for you watching right now. And, and it really comes down to a desire by not just Newtopia, but hopefully everyone in the healthcare industry trying to reverse this progression of cost, whereby if you're a risk-bearing employer today or a consultant to a risk-bearing employer, you've got this sort of risk stratification and cost stratification that's looking you in the face where your average healthy member should be costing about $3,400 per year in just paid, hard paid medical costs. And I'm referring strictly to inpatient, outpatient, emergency room costs, not productivity, productivity absenteeism, presenteeism. Those are all on top of that. So just hard medical costs. Here's where the problem lies, and Greg was alluding to it. Today, 80% of the US population has one out of five, out of those five key risk factors out of range. So risk-bearing employers don't have many green folks that are healthy left. They're now left with the spectrum of yellow, orange, and red. Once you add one more risk to the pile, now you're at two, sorry, you're at um, two, uh, you're at that you know, sort of roughly 50% of the population uh, sitting in that bucket. And what's happened is two things have changed. One, as Greg mentioned, the risk for chronic disease has now started to go up, but so too is the cost. There's a 60% jump in cost from $3,400 to roughly $5,400. Keep in mind that person hasn't been diagnosed with anything clinical yet. Um, and what makes this so scary pre-COVID was that within a short period of time, if COVID didn't exist, that $5,400 could easily 3X in cost and become $15,000 a year if that person develops type 2 diabetes or could 4X in cost and become $20,000 a year if that individual develops um, cardiovascular disease. What COVID has introduced is, is a whole new risk factor here. And so based on the literature that Greg reviewed and what, we, what we're all seeing um, with COVID, if you just advance, there's another cost increase now whereby these individuals at risk have the same underlying risk factors that could require uh, either hospitalization, intensive care, ventilation, and, uh, and, and worst case, uh, untimely early death which adds just a greater cost burden onto a self-insured employer um, at a time when there was already a tremendous amount of cost burden. And so the reason for presenting this data today is that um, self-insured employers just can't afford not to look at and focus on their at-risk population. And ultimately our hope is to bring evidence of going with a, a very proven approach um, that's been proven clinically uh, and that backs it up uh, through the right business model uh, that aligns with, most importantly, ensuring that the health of your um, entire employee population, but especially the at-risk population and the financial health of the organization uh, are completely aligned. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Mark and thank you very much. All right, cool questions. Thank you very much, uh, Hassan, uh, Greg, and Jeff for a very intriguing and, uh, and timely discussion. So uh, at this time, I would like to, if you have any questions, please enter those questions into the, the chat or, uh, or the uh, question uh, component, and we'll pose those to the respective panelists. Um, give a few minutes for people to, uh, to pose their, their questions. Um, we also have uh, uh, a couple uh, right here. So I'll get started with, with one that I know uh, came in from someone who said they weren't going to be able to make the uh, presentation, but uh, this one's for Hassan. Um, um, is this a program uh, that uh, an employer uh, should implement only on a, a plan year, or would you suggest implementing something like this uh, off, off plan year? Uh, I, I guess it, it depends on the, the, the plan design. If you want to integrate it with incentives, sometimes those are easier to track from a January plan design year. Um, you know, having been on the employer side for a long time, I know there's never a great time to implement a program because there's always competing interests, but 
I think with the urgency of making sure that health needs are met and the health is managed and some of these risks are reduced, but postponing it um, and waiting for that perfect time, you may never have it. While, and as you, the longer you wait, the greater chances of those risks are gonna increase and start compounding. So um, there's no time like the present. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Hassan. Um, Next question, Jeff. Look, this is this is one for you. Um, what is the difference between uh, the Nutopia program offering and, and uh, traditional, you know, weight loss programs like uh, Weight Watchers or or Noom? Yeah, th thanks, Mark, and thanks for the question. I I'd say um, really the the, the 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 differences fall into two different categories. I would say, um, you know, if if you were sort of listening to the the, the comments earlier, what, Newtopia is really focused on having a, a positive impact across those five key metabolic risks, um, and, and so that's that's our outcome goal, uh, and, and that's really where we see the biggest opportunity to improve uh, total health and, and to reduce the risk of chronic uh, lifestyle related chronic disease. Weight is very important, it is, uh, you know, as, as Greg had mentioned earlier, uh, it's certainly a, a major singular. Um, uh, issue, but it's not. We're not looking for weight loss in and of itself. Um, we're using uh, body weight that you know that 4.3, as we mentioned in our RCT, or we've just sort of rolled that up to 5%, uh, growing to that 10% as a proxy, really to improve um, to see improvement in those five key metabolic risks, uh, and that's where we saw the cost savings uh, ultimately. And so, I'd say. Fundamentally, a Newtopia is not a, a weight loss program in and of itself. Uh, we're using uh, body weight as a key risk factor. We're using it as a proxy to drive and improve those five key risk factors. Um, and the second is uh, just in, in around uh, some of the motivation that individuals have. Um, the, the two companies that you refer to, both fantastic, tend to operate uh, more at a, a direct-to-consumer level. Um, which Newtopia doesn't do today. And so the only opportunity to access Newtopia is really through our partnerships with uh, innovative uh, employers or innovative insurers who are offering it on behalf of their at-risk employees. And, and the reason that difference is, is important is because oftentimes a direct-to-consumer weight loss approach will usually be focused in on somewhat uh, oftentimes short-term goals, right? Uh, consumers tend to be focused on here and now and want to invest in things here and now. Oftentimes that's uh, you know, to lose weight, potentially to get into a picture or maybe a bathing suit or, or for an upcoming event. Um, and oftentimes the expectations around it is um, let's, let's do it quick and then let's move on. It's a little bit of that diet mentality. Um, it's quite considerably different than the approach that we're taking, which is actually um, fairly long. Uh, it, longer in its orientation, that have changed that Newtopia is pressing for um, because it's not being offered direct to consumer and it's not trying to tie into that instant gratification. Um, we have the opportunity to really work incrementally and build these small, tiny habit change, which is, uh, which is the key to our success at being able to develop these outcomes that grow. And so, um, again, I, I think our differentiation is, is more about uh, we're there on the disease prevention side uh, and on achieving um, better overall health than we are strictly looking at uh, pounds on a scale uh, or trying to achieve a, a short-term weight loss target. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for that explanation and the answer. Um, we have another question here. Uh, can you explain more about the genetic factors and how prevalent they are? Sure. Uh, the uh, genetic factors that, that we chose uh, were first selected by a, a world-class team of uh, genetic leaders um, who, whose sole goal was to try and identify um, uh, genes that have been studied uh, population-wide around the world that have had uh, a contributing factor to both being able to answer both of those two questions uh, for us. Uh, and so the, the three genes that we currently study today, uh, FTO, MC4R, and DRD2, um, happen to you know, have a prevalence you know, globally uh, in and around, let's call it 30% of the population, thereabouts, uh, in the general population. What's been really fascinating is that within the Newtopia population, um, we've seen uh, over 2x uh, of that, uh, oftentimes closer to 70% prevalence. And of course, there's a huge self-selection bias here, right, in that we are looking at a, an at-risk population, 
and we are looking at um, uh, individuals who self-select. Uh, but we've seen a, a, a much higher representation in our book of business population than in the general population. Um, and what we're really using this tool for, again, is not to be prescriptive. Um, as Dr. Steinberg has told me many times, we, we don't believe the science is there to uh, provide, uh, to, to, to deem causality uh, or to suggest that because these genes are here, then therefore we should be able to provide very micro recommendations across nutrition or exercise uh, or behavior and uh, sort of um, behavioral or mental health. I, I don't think the science is there for that. But as an engagement and a motivation tool, again, to answer those two key questions that I referred to before, uh, we've seen it's a very elegant way. Um, and it also signals to individuals in the employee, po in the employee population uh, that um, this is something that's really going to be built for them. It's really going to be tailored and personalized as opposed to just another guideline-based approach uh, that may not really be built for them. So while I'm on the subject, it's completely optional. Uh, and so we're not forcing anyone to provide saliva or a genetic sample if they don't want to. Um, so it is completely opt-in uh, at the registration point. Number two, it is totally uh, private. We never share the results with anyone, uh, certainly not ACME, uh, not a plan, not a consultant. They, strict, they stay strictly between Steve and Utopia. And finally, uh, we've gone through great pains to ensure that they are completely regulatory compliant uh, and meet all of the CAP, CLIA, uh, HIPAA, and, um, uh, and uh, GINA regulations uh, throughout the United States. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Actually, uh, you had no idea, but you actually uh, answered the, uh, the next question, and that was how, how do you overcome an employee concern regarding health and medical privacy? I, I think the, the, the tail end of your response there actually covered it. Um, um, so I wanted you to ask that question, Jeff. And Hassan, I think from the, the benefit perspective, uh, how do you uh, juxtapose that question with, with your employee population? Again, just ensuring that there's a health and medical privacy for uh, the population. Sure. So it, it, yeah, it just takes careful administration and communication and over communicating to your employees about the, the fact that it's private and make sure that if you have an incentive program involved in, in tracking participation that it's handled uh, externally outside of your team and that your your administrators handling the incentive piece and um, you know it's, it, you have to just spend time building trust with your team and staff for your employee population just to make sure that they know you don't want their genetic information in the first place so it's um, like every other program you have um, this is sensitive just because of genetic it, it, possibilities within it um but this is even more sensitive so um just a question of over communicating okay all right thank you just just mark on that before you go to the next i mean this is this is uh, an issue of course that's um, relatively new and and uh and cutting edge on the precision health side you know i, I can say that um we've seen a overwhelmingly high demand while it is opt-out uh, an overwhelmingly high demand from the uh, from at-risk employees within our book of business to participate, you know, with a, an uptake rate of of well north of 80 percent and a completion rate of well north of 80 uh, percent, and so uh, it signals to us that of course privacy and security are are fundamental, um, but more important to individuals are build something for me that really helps you to understand me, meet me where I am so that this can be all about me and my habits. Uh, and that becomes very difficult to do without that level of understanding and information. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, all right, um, the last question would be, uh, why would a, a client implement Newtopia and, and possibly consider keeping their current wellness program? I'll, I'll pose that question to you, Jeff. I, we are, uh, you know, to Hassan had mentioned before, just the, the need to, to make sure you've got an ecosystem playing well together. And um, we, we don't see ourselves um, uh, necessarily overlapping or, um, or uh, cannibalizing, as Hassan rightly pointed out, existing wellness programs. In, in fact, you know, the, the, uh, the ability to identify individuals at risk through health risk assessments, um, the ability to communicate uh, engage and incentivize um, are really critical. And so 
I can't think of one uh, client, a partner of ours today that doesn't have an existing um, communication, engagement, wellness platform in place. Um, and we, we, we just like to fit along inside. Um, we're really targeting that roughly 50% of at-risk population uh, out there. And, and so uh, we don't offer something for everyone in the population, uh, but we think we can be a, a really great adjunct um, on top of an existing wellness platform, also alongside the appropriate condition management platform so that ultimately Newtopia can be uh, helping as a bit of a, a wayfinder and, and helping to navigate um, individuals from that sort of maybe that that lower risk into our risk, into the higher risk and back and forth. Uh, and, and ultimately uh, we've got the technology and the willingness to, to really play well and build that ecosystem. Uh, understanding that no one player can handle all of those pieces together. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I think that uh, at the present time, that uh, that concludes all the questions that we had posed. Um, uh, next slide here. If there are any additional questions or concerns about uh, uh, about habit change, um, employer costs, things of that nature, please feel free to contact us. We wanted to, again, thank everyone for their uh, participation uh, in this webinar. I want to thank all of our panelists as well as all of our uh, guests who, who chimed in to, to learn more about uh, the case for habit change to prevent disease and, and lower costs. So uh, that being said, we'll conclude the webinar. Thanks, everyone, for attending.